Alrighty, welcome back. I'm the Strategy Professor, and this is going to be a complete beginner's guide to Total War Warhammer 2. So as always, if you enjoy the content, please be sure to like and subscribe. It helps out a ton. Check out the channel. We're always adding new Total War Warhammer content. We have dozens and dozens of legendary campaigns, um, and we're always adding more. If you'd like to sponsor a campaign yourself, just email me at thestrategyprofessor at gmail.com. I'll do any campaign that you'd like. I can even use some of the more popular mods out there, like SFO, Radius, or any other mods you want to see. Just uh, $30 for 10 episodes or $25 for your channel member. Um, and if you want to see more episodes, we can add on some more as well. I can also help you crowdfund that. If you're interested in a longer campaign, I can you know tell other people on the channel about it, market it for you, and we'll see if we can get a bunch of people to chip in and do some more, if you're interested in that. We also cover League of Legends and um, been doing a Witcher 3 playthrough as well that was sponsored uh, by somebody. If you'd like to sponsor a playthrough of a different game, just $5 an hour plus the cost of the game. I can help you crowdsource it if you want to do that. And we stream every night starting around 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time till about 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time um, on YouTube. And right now that's just for League of Legends. I'm a Diamond Support main in League of Legends. Play mostly support, a little bit of jungle. We might start doing a Total War stream during the weekend though, but just subscribe, follow the channel, and um, I'll let you know about that. We'll see, my lifestyle's kind of busy because I already do so much content a family man with a wife, a daughter, and then I also am an English uh, professor at a major American university. Anyways, enough preamble, let's go ahead and get in here. Um, so, special thanks to Lucas Neal for sponsoring this campaign. I really appreciate it, and he wanted, or this um, guide, and he really wanted me to focus on Tyrion, because he came on stream, he said he hadn't played Total War in a while, and he said, okay, if I'm just getting back into it, a Total War Warmer 2 faction, who should I pick as a beginner? And I said, Tyrion Hyald. There's a couple reasons for this. Let's talk about some of the Lord effects, then we'll get in there, and I'll discuss why I think High Elves are a really good choice to start off um, Warhammer. If you don't have any other DLCs, no experience, um, they're a great place to start. But let's talk specifically about Tyrion here. Well, he's a very capable fighter. We'll show you the stats when we get in there, so that is pretty helpful. He can go out there and help you duel some of the early Lords um, and just face tank a lot of um, early infantry if that's something you need to do. You do get plus 20 diplomacy with other high elves, which is huge because the high elves are all about trying to increase your diplomacy and get confederations and gain control of Ulthuan, the big island where they start. Get minus 50% for Shrine of Cain. That's okay, it can come in handy later. But this is the big ticket stuff. You get minus one um, recruitment duration for infantry and cavalry units. A lot of the higher level infantry and cav will take two turns. Um, so that can really save you a lot of time in your recruitment later on. And then really big for him is you get minus 50% upkeep for most of your infantry that you're going to be using throughout the game. Spearmen, Silver, and Guard, who are basically upgraded spears. Rangers, who are kind of like sword units. Um, archers, and then even your entry-level cav with the Silver Helms. So you can have a very um, diverse, effective army early on in the game for a massive reduction in cost, which means that you can be spending that money you know, upgrading your infrastructure in other towns, maybe fielding a second army, building more units in your main army. Upkeep cost reduction is massive. It's one of the best stats in the game, particularly something that covers this many different units that are all going to be useful early on in the campaign. And then you do get plus three recruit rank for Lothar and Seaguard, so we'll get into that a little bit more as we get in there. But these are some of the best units that you can get, some of the mid-tier um, units. Those are going to be very, very strong, and that complements some um, buildings that you have in your main town as well. Okay. So, legendary, uh, very hard. We're not going to actually play through this campaign, but um, we'll go ahead and start it. I will say on that note, I'm pretty sure I have at least one Tyrion campaign on the channel. We'll skip this. You can watch the uh, intro um, if you want. We'll just save a little time. Try to keep this to about 30 minutes if possible. It's a lot to cover in 30, but we're going to try. But I do have lots of other High Elf uh, campaign gameplay. I know that very recently I did an Emirate campaign. I'll have that linked at the very beginning of this video, and I'll have it linked at the end as well. And then I'll see if I can dig up um, a Tyrion video that I did as well because I'm pretty sure I have a Tyrion video also um, that'll be a little bit older <clears throat> and there, I'm not going to be able to cover like live combat in this guide there's just not going to be time I can do another guide like that updated if people want it I do have an older live combat guide that I can link for you and I'll have that linked at the uh, end of the video so be sure to go to the end if you want to see it I think those links only show up on PC as well at the beginning and the end so um you know, if you're interested in those links, then make sure that you're looking at the beginning of the end. And I can also link them in the description for you, just in case you're on mobile. 
Okay. So let's walk through some beginner stuff here. So... This is kind of the overall map, just to start with the super basics. Um, your main place that you want to control is Ulthuan, this big island. I believe if you control the island, you can win the race. Um, and we'll talk about the win condition here in a second. You might have to uh, venture out just a little bit further. I pretty much always do Mortal Empires, which requires the first game. If you have the first and the second game, usually you can get the first one really cheap. And you can do something that is like an even bigger map, and it doesn't have this major win condition. It's pretty much just conquer the world, and that's your win condition. Um, the vast, vast majority of people who donate want Mortal Empires, but you won't have that unless you get the first game as well, which, once again, is probably not that expensive. You can probably get a bundle deal um, fairly cheaply, but I will just assume that you only have Warhammer 2, and that's what this guide's going to cover. Um, so that's the bigger map overall and then uh, this win condition basically every town that you have is going to gain you a little bit of this resource um called uh way fragments but there are certain nodes and i don't remember where they are in ulthuan i don't think i've done a high elf in ulthuan but there are certain nodes where you get bonus waystones there's probably two or three around here and it'll give you like five per turn or it might even be 10 per turn and you can complete some quests and get some various ways as well but the main thing is you want to be able to control at least four of those most likely in order to comfortably win the race now you can confederate and get down into um lustria as well let me see jungle's unpleasant for him though so he can do um frozen temperate island and savannah Okay, so the more likely place you'd want to go is to try to um, confederate with Aletha Nar and then um, gain control of a lot of this property to gain um, more waystones. But yeah, you want to control four or five of those, and that should be enough to win the race. Now, don't be discouraged because they will get ahead of you early on. They get lots of bonuses to that, especially on higher difficulty levels. I'm not sure about lower difficulty levels. It might be a little different. Um... Oh, they changed around. Okay. I didn't realize they changed around the geography a little bit over here. Um. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I haven't, I haven't, I guess I haven't looked at the vortex in a while, but either way, that that's kind of your main thing is you want to be able to control four towns and or four of the special uh, waypoints. And if they beat you, that's fine. Once you get up to this point, then you can start a ritual. And basically what that does is chaos will be coming in, pouring in. It'll tell you the three towns where they could appear. And they appear somewhere in that area. Then they start walking towards you, multiple armies of chaos. So I would highly recommend that you are strong by then uh, before you accept the quest. And you have to be able to hold the area for 10 turns. And you still gain fragments even if you don't do the quest. So if you reach this little uh, checkpoint at 350, even if you don't do it right away, you'll still keep gaining towards the next checkpoint at 1060. So there's no rush to finish it. If you do complete it, you do get certain bonuses like recruitment, you get public order, and you get some other good stuff for completing it. But don't rush it. I think a really good strategy is just to wait until you're super strong and then just do like three or four of them in a row at the end. Um, I would highly recommend that you have Lightning Strike as well. Let's go ahead and talk about the skills here very quickly. So with your main lord or with any of the lords that you have, if you click on this button here, it'll tell you the skills you can get. Every time you level up, you get one skill point. You can go all the way up to level 40. You gain levels by winning battles. And your experience is determined by the victory type of the battle. So if you have a decisive victory, then you're going to gain more experience. If you have a Pyrrhic victory, you're going to gain less experience. But as you level up, then you get points. And there are a few major types of trees. And this is what you'll see with all factions. So a lot of this stuff is going to apply to all factions. And then we'll talk more specifically about high elves after we talk about just some basic game mechanics here. Um, but these are your quest battles. You have to be a certain rank to start these. They have varying difficulty levels. I can't remember exactly how hard these are. Usually the higher level stuff is going to be trickier. So I would just say make sure you have at least a 20 stack. This one's pretty good. It gives him a little bit of extra health. Um, extra leadership aura is good. And then you get this dragon armor. Sunfang is the huge one, especially at higher difficulty levels, because you get plus three public order to all provinces, faction-wide, which is huge. 
And then you also get um, a breath attack, which doesn't consume any magic, and you can do it every two minutes, which is pretty strong. Um, but it is level 10. So he has three pretty good weapons. Um, then usually there's just kind of your miscellaneous skills up here. He can get a mount. Um, he can get uh, just a couple of protection ones. So not that great, but they're okay. The mount is probably worthwhile most of the time. Um, it doesn't look like it gives him any extra armor, but it does give him extra health, charge bonus, move speed, stuff like that. So usually mounts are good unless you're in a siege. If you're in a siege, you may not want the mount because you won't be able to climb the walls. And if you come in through the gate, a lot of people stack a bunch of spears at the gate. And if you get tied up with spears on horseback, then you're going to be in big trouble. It's going to do a ton of damage to you. So on sieges where the movement doesn't matter as much because you just you have to either climb up the wall or go through these very tiny choke points, I would probably take him off the mount. But open field, the mount's usually a good idea. Then you have kind of these specialty ones. Usually you want to get these pretty early when you can. So starting level 12, extra leadership, um, some various stats which are good. Diplomacy with high elves, which is really good. We'll talk about diplomacy here in a second. So most of these are going to be pretty good. Extra global recruitment capacity, upkeep reduction for everybody faction-wide, which once again, that is massive. Um, you got to be careful with this one. This does give him a lot of power, 20% weapon strength and extra melee attack, but you get minus one public order in all provinces. So it is good, especially on lower difficulty levels. Um, it can be good, but you gotta be careful on higher difficulty levels with the public order. And then this one is another uh, minus one. So these like make him personally more powerful, but you lose public order because people are scared of you. Um, I think you have to choose between Bloodline of Anarian and um, Majesty of Ulthuan. I can't remember if they force you to choose or not. But just be very careful with this one because this one can give you a lot of negative public order. So once again, lower difficulty levels, fine. Higher difficulty levels may not be worth it. But these over here are definitely worth it. Now the stuff that's standard for all of the elves, so th this will be a little bit different depending on your high elf lord, or if you're a different faction, obviously it'll be different. But usually the specialty stuff is often pretty good, so you want to look into that, and that's this kind of top tree here. And then for the high elves, um, you can dedicate to one of these. You can't pick both. Um... And it just kind of depends on your play style in general, but what you're looking for here is cost reduction on really important units. That's going to be one of the biggest things. Um, so this right here is quite good. Sacking of settlements plus 15% is good. Dragons, upkeep, they're very expensive, very powerful units, so that's a really good one. Um, if you're going to have a lot of rangers, archers, stuff like that, then this one can be really good. Casualty replenishment rate is strong. Um, and you get a reduction to the spears, but the spears and those things are pretty inexpensive anyways, especially with your earliest discount. So I would probably go, um, I would probably go with the dragon one. The, um, yeah, there we go. Dedicated to Adioth. Sorry if I'm butchering that. And then here you have kind of his, um, solo stuff. I don't get this. I think this is like, this does make him a better personal attacker and duelist. But I'd rather buff up your entire army than just buff up him as a fighter most of the time. If you do want to get this, I would recommend getting the defensive stuff, so like the 12 melee defense. And the main reason you would do this is if you want him to go out there and primarily just face tank a whole bunch of other units. And that's really good if you have life magic. We'll talk about the magic here in a second. Um, oh, this is definitely going over 30 minutes <laughs> the way I'm going. But in general, I wouldn't go down this tree. But if you are going to go down this tree... Um, then get the defensive stuff and you would do that just so that you can kind of get more archers and have to run less infantry because he's going to be tougher and he can go up there and uh, tank a lot of stuff if you go that route. Now over here um, this is quite good. This combined elites. This gives you a ton of different stuff. So you get um, melee attack, melee defense for spears, silver and guard, um, archers and Lothar and sea guard. Wow, they gave it to archers too. Wow, that's a new thing, I think. Um, the extra melee attack and defense. This is pretty much a must-have. It's every early game unit that you're going to get. It even includes some early game um, cavalry stuff with the Silver Helms and uh, Illyrian Reavers, which are kind of rare. You don't get a lot of those, but you even get bonuses for those on top of it, which is nice. And then you have extra ammo for... Um, Archer, Sea Guard, and then even your high level stuff like your Sisters of Avalorn, even some of your artillery like your Bolt Throwers. This is super good as well. So both of these are tough. It depends on kind of where you want to go and what you want to do. I tend to like to get the Bowmaster first and then getting Combined Elites, but I think they recently buffed this to where 
Um, they added the Silver Helm stuff to it, so that's really nice. Um, Sky Master's pretty bad. I wouldn't get that. Uh, Sword Masters. This is great later on if you want to run a lot of Sword Masters. You don't have to. Honestly, I don't do it a lot. I'd rather spend the money on like Sisters of Avalorn and Dragons and just use like early game infantry just spears to hold the line, some Silver and Guard or something. And then this is not that great either. Uh, the melee attack and the weapon strength for dragons are good, but um, or the, actually those are just dragon princes, the sky masters for dragons. So it's like, it's not really gonna be worth your time. And then this, once stuff gets to level seven, you can just kind of decide if you have a bunch of units in your army that have this, this would be good. And this is the strong, this is probably one of the stronger ones, missile strength 12% and then 10 armor for your ranged units. And then the extra five melee defense for your uh, melee units can be pretty good. Now, the blue tree is really underrated, I think, by a lot of um, rookie players, but this is one of the strongest trees, especially if you're playing the Vortex campaign, because what will happen is you'll get swarms and swarms of chaos coming in from those gates whenever you do those rituals, and you want to be able to take those out one-on-one, -on -one, so that means you're going to need Lightning Strike. Um, so, Lightning Strike over here is one of the most powerful skills in the whole game. Basically, you can force a 1v1 against an enemy army, even if they have a bunch of allies nearby. So this is typically what will happen when you see Chaos, is they'll have like three armies. You might have 120 stack, and if you normally attack them, those other two armies are going to reinforce. So then you're going to have to do 20 on 60, which is going to be very difficult. If you have Lightning Strike, however, then you get to force that one-on-one. -on -one. You can take out each army one at a time, 20 versus 20, which is a lot easier doing three 20 versus 20 fights than one 20 versus 60 fight. Um, you can even lightning strike, take one out, and then like retreat back to your town, see if you can heal up for a turn. Um, if they siege you, then you can you know lightning strike them again if you need to. So you can do these kind of like hit and run tactics as well. Now, if you lightning strike, that means that your allies will not reinforce as well. So if you're near a garrison or something like that, be careful with lightning strike because sometimes it might be more beneficial for you to have your garrison's help rather than to try to take it 20 on 20. So if your garrison has 20 units in it, you have 20 in your army, and they have two 20 stacks, but one of their armies is really weak and your garrison's really strong, it might be better to opt into the 40 on 40. Now I will say as a newer player, you want to keep the battle small. So I would not try to fight 40 versus 40s if you can at all help it, because it's just a bunch of extra stuff you have to click. The AI can do it perfectly. It doesn't matter how many units it has to control. It can control them all at the same time with the same efficiency as it, it would. You know, it can control three units with the same efficiency as it could control 40. But humans, there's a lot more errors when you're an actual person trying to control that many units. So Lightning Strike, very, very important. And so uh, you want Root Marcher early on. That's 10% campaign movement range. And then um, <clears throat> depending on how many Skaven... Like, this one's pretty good. The enemy hero success chance minus 15% is pretty good. So I would either do bonded service or success chance. Get down to here. One point in the other. Draft master is good. Extra recruitment capacity means you can hire one extra unit per turn. is going to be really strong. Lightning strike. Then you have a bunch of other awesome stuff down here, too. This is one of the best blue trees in the game. Um, you have the 15% upkeep reduction on all units. That's additive. So that means if you get 50% off of your spears... And then you get 15% off here, then it would be 65%. And then if you get an extra 8% here, then it's 73% off. And then if you get one of these up here that lowers spear cost, then it's even less. So you can get units down to an extremely cheap value. Um, so yeah, Quartermaster, super strong. Replenishment, 15% super good. That means after a battle, if you're on friendly territory, it determines how many units, like how much your um, battalions are going to heal at the end of every turn. So it's really, really strong to have casualty replenishment rate. Elven Scholar, it's 15% research, which is very good for upgrading your technologies, and a 24% extra chance that you're gonna get extra items after battle, which is very strong. And then Feared and Renowned is just everything that's good. Enemy Hero Success Chance minus 10%, Recruit Rank, Upkeep Reduction, Campaign Movement Speed, it's just super, super powerful. So what I would recommend in the early game is probably going Bowmaster, Seeing if you need to get combined elites or not, you're probably okay going for Bowmaster and combined elites and then just get the Root Marcher. Get to Lightning Strike before you do your first ritual. 
And then um, if you do this stuff right here, this is going to help you out with those quest battles. So you might want to go ahead and get all these first, just so you can do these early quest battles. Because this actually makes your army a lot stronger, versus this is kind of like your campaign management stuff. And then come down here, Lightning Strike, Quartermaster, Feared and Renown, and then probably Elven Healing. And then just sort of feel it out from there. And you want to pick up these, you know, as you see fit. Okay. Um... All right, let's walk through just some basic stats here as well, since we are talking about some of that combat. <clears throat> and we won't take too long, but um, we'll pull up. This is a unit card if you hover over a unit, and then um, you get some basic stuff here that'll tell you. This right here tells you the entity size, so that will let you know if it is considered a small unit or if it's considered a large unit, and this can impact how other units interact with it. So most notably, spears are very good against large units. So if we look at um, the Spearman over here, you'll see it has a little icon, a sword with a large unit, bonus versus large. You click on this, whenever they're fighting a large unit, they get that bonus. And what that is, is that's 15 extra melee attack and 15 extra weapon strength. Um, so it's really strong. We'll talk about those stats here in just a second, but just understand and these are small units uh, right here. So some things have bonus versus small. There's a lot less of them in the base game. So like Sword Masters of Hoath, for example, do get a bonus versus uh, infantry of 14. But most of what you see is stuff having bonuses versus large. But yeah, that can matter um, in terms of bonuses. Then if we look over here, you have armor. Now what armor does is every two points of armor is a 1% reduction um, in physical damage. Okay? And so... Um, what that means is, you know, if someone would hit you for 100 and you have 100 armor, it's going to reduce it by 50%, so they're only going to hit you for 50. Okay? And then armor does have some interactions with... Um, armor does have some interactions with some magical spells. They'll say they do reduce damage versus armor, so fire spells are notorious for that. Um, and armor does also reduce... It's any attack that's coming through doing damage to you so it also includes magical attacks which is kind of weird we'll talk about magical attacks here in a second but uh, magical attacks go through physical resist but armor still reduces magical attacks so the only thing that gets through armor is armor piercing damage so i'll show you um like the sword masters have pretty high armor piercing damage so you'll see this right here base weapon strength 11 armor piercing damage 25 that means that that 25 damage ignores all armor. So it doesn't matter if you have a million armor, it's still doing 25 damage. And then the 11, the base damage, the 11 is reduced by the armor. So if you have, um, if you're hitting somebody who has 100 armor, that would get reduced by 50% down to 5.5 damage. Okay, so that's important to remember. Armor piercing goes through armor, but then armor can also block magical damage. So something that does magical damage would be like right here. Um, units that are protected from regular physical attacks. So magic damage cuts through physical resist. That's it. Okay, so it has no interaction with armor whatsoever. So if we have something that has a lot of physical resist and the base game doesn't have a ton of that. So these dragon princes have some. So this has 20% physical resist and it says non-magical attacks. So this means anyone that does any physical damage is going to get reduced. That includes armor piercing damage. Okay, so I know it kind of gets sort of confusing, but um, the physical resist will cut through or will block any damage that's not magical. Okay, so in other words, if you're tr if you're against a foe that has a lot of armor piercing damage, ideally you're going to pick units that to uh, match up to them in battle that um, have a lot of physical resist. So like Wraith units are excellent against something like um, Sword Master type of units that have really high physical damage. Um, so it's kind of like the paper, rock, scissors that you want to look at, whereas um, physical resist um, is going to be is going to beat armor piercing damage, or is very good against armor piercing damage. Magical attacks are going to be very good against physical resist, Armor is going to be very good against everything that's not armor piercing, and then armor piercing is going to be good against armor. And then fire is its own special thing, fire resistance and flaming attacks. Flaming attacks are not magical. 
they are just flaming attacks and there are certain things that are weak to fire mostly regenerating things like trolls and stuff like that and it'll say on it like weakness to fire okay so that's just kind of your melee stuff as far as ranged goes some units will have a shield this blocks a certain percentage of small arms fire so that means non-artillery fire so arrows basically arrows or gunshots um, so that means that you're basically you're going to take 55% less damage from those types of things. So if someone is firing a bunch of physical arrows, magical arrows, it doesn't matter. You're still going to block 55% of it. And all of this stacks with armor. So if you have something that has a lot of armor and has a big shield like that, it's going to be taking virtually no damage from uh, ranged missile units. So be very careful with your archers that you try not to fire into people with silver shields if there are better targets available. Okay, so if you can fire into some infantry with silver shields, or you can try to fire into their archers that have, like, no shields, um, like some wraiths, some dark elf, um, or shades, rather, dark elf shades, then you would want to fire into those. Because they're going to take way more damage. So always look for that shield. There's a silver shield. There's a bronze shield. I don't know if um, elves even have some bronze shields. Yeah, here we go. The bronze shield, I think it is 35, 30% small arms fire. And then there's a golden shield, which very, very few units have, but that's 70% small arm fire block. Okay. Um, and missile fire is not affected by uh, melee attack and melee defense. We'll talk about that here in a second. But it's affected by everything else we just talked about. Physical resist can apply to it. Um, some things fire magical arrows. Magic resist can, fire, can apply to that. So, for instance, the Sisters of Avalorn fire magical arrows. So that cuts through all physical resist, but can be reduced if they have magic damage reduction. And some units do have magic damage reduction. So that reduces not only spell magic, but also magical attacks and magical projectiles. So, for example, a lot of wards will have some sort of magical resist. Uh, Tyrion actually doesn't. But you can get items that give you some magical resist as well. Um, and that does work, like I said, against um, melee, ranged, and spells. So it can be pretty good. There's also another stat called missile resistance. And this reduces all damage that you take from missile fire. So if you have heavy armor, silver shield, lots of physical resist, and missile resist, then you're definitely not taking any damage from ranged attacks. And there's another one that's called a ward save. Um, that's basically physical resist and magic resist all rolled into one. And that's obviously super powerful, so not a lot of units have that. I don't know if we have any up here that have ward save. But that is something that you can get um, on some lords out there. Yeah, most baseline units are not going to have that in the base game. But yeah, certain lords, when you get certain items, will have a ward save, and it just looks like a little like bronze or like golden type of shield down here um and that'll just let you know they're very resistant to almost all types of damage okay <clears throat> another couple of status effects jeez yeah it's definitely gonna be closer to an hour the one i have to go through um so we got armor leadership once leadership gets below a certain threshold and I, like usually when it falls below zero then um your unit is very likely to run and when they're running away they can potentially rally back if they're not being chased um, but they're just they're just gonna run. They don't do anything, um, and they continue taking damage. So you don't want your units to run away. There's a chance they can rally back, but in general, you want your leadership to be fairly high. There are lots of things that affect leadership. I'm not gonna have time to go into all of that. Um, but it's just stuff that you would think would be kind of scary is scary. So some of the biggest stuff is if the general dies, it's gonna lower your leadership a ton. If the enemy general dies, it, the same is true of the enemy, right? If, if you kill their general, it's going to hurt their leadership really badly. Um, so general dying, really huge leadership penalty. If other people are dying around you or running, so for instance, if like your neighbors on both sides of your flanks run away, that can cause a chain break where it's just like a domino effect where everybody keeps running. Because the more and more people that run, especially units that are very close, is going to inspire other people to run. Just like you would imagine, you're on the battlefield, you see people running away, you're like, oh god, are we losing? Do I run? And then you start questioning yourself, it hurts your leadership. Um, so, general dying, other people running away, casualties sustained if a lot of people in the unit have died or if they've taken a lot of damage. 
<clears throat> they're more likely to run. Um, getting flanked, so getting hit in the back is a huge one. So you always want to try to charge in the back with cavalry if you can, um, because it causes huge penalties by doing that as well. Getting shot with like arrows in the side or the back. So getting flanked, people dying around you, um, taking a lot of damage, and general status of the general are all very important for leadership. Then there are certain spells that can affect leadership as well, and there are certain types of effects out there that can affect leadership. So big monsters, for example, can cause fear, which lowers leadership, I think, by like 15 or so, 15 or 20. And then there's terror, which is a certain percentage chance to make a melee opponent route for a short period of time. Now, a terror run is not the same as a normal leadership run because they will automatically rally back after a certain amount of time. So I don't remember the exact timings on that, but if something causes terror to something else, then um, they might run away for five seconds and then rally back or something like that. Um, so terror is super strong uh, because it can just make people break before they get to leadership zero. So the lower their leadership is, the more likely they are to be terrored and run away. So if they fall to like 30 leadership, it becomes increasingly likely that they're gonna run from a terror-causing beast. Now the only people who are gonna be immune to this are other terror-causing beasts are immune to terror and fear. So that's good. And then there are some things that are like immune to psychology. Um, things that cause fear like the Great Eagle are not affected by other things that cause fear. Um, I don't remember any immune to psych. These guys probably are. No, they're not actually. Um, but you'll see some units that maybe don't cause terror themselves but do have immunity to psychology like usually berserker type of units or like really high level infantry sometimes have that it looks like the high elves really don't have a lot of that though so I can't show you the icon but basically if something causes terror it's immune to psychology but there are some units with other factions that can be immune to psych without necessarily causing terror okay um, speed, just how fast does a unit move? Now, melee attack is um, combined with melee. Def the enemy it interacts with the enemy's melee defense to determine your percentage chance to hit every time you swing in melee. So you just take the melee attack minus the melee defense. So the melee attack of the offensive person minus the melee defense of the defensive person, and that's your percentage chance to hit. And there is a minimum of a fifteen percent chance to hit, and a maximum of an eighty-five percent chance to hit. So. If you have someone who has 100 melee attack and someone who has 50 melee defense, um, and the baseline is 45. So if both of them are even, then it's 45. And then you add on whatever the differential is. So let's say that someone has 60 melee attack and someone has 40 melee defense. The differential is 20 in favor of the attacker. So the chance to hit would be 45% base plus 20, 65% chance to hit. Okay, um, then that can go the other way around. If someone has um, 60 melee defense and someone has 40 melee attack, then you take the 45, 20 more in favor of the defender. So you do 45 minus 20, and that's 25% for the attacker to hit the defender. So melee attack and melee defense only affects melee, um, does not affect range at all, and it has no interaction with armor armor piercing, magical attacks, all that kind of stuff. It just determines if a hit's even going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so in order for you to actually do damage to someone in melee, you have to land a hit on them, given the melee attack, melee defense parameters, and then it's going to look at um, armor, physical resist, any other type of resist that you have. Okay. Um, so melee attack is something also, or melee defense is something also that's very, very good against high armor piercing damage. Because most things that have high armor piercing are usually like mace type of units and um, just stuff that doesn't have high melee attack often. So if you have high melee defense, that can be a pretty good safeguard against um, heavy armor piercing things. And then you have weapon strength. We talked about that. It's split between base weapon damage and armor piercing damage. Armor piercing is way better because it bypasses armor. Um, but, you know, base is something to take into consideration. Um, and then you want to look to see if there's any bonuses, if they have magical attacks, flaming attacks, anything like that. Sometimes there are different types of effects that they do on their attacks as well. And then you have the charge bonus. Now, this one... Um, 
they've changed this a little over time i believe when you charge somebody so when you attack them when you're not engaged when you hit them for the first time when you run at them you get a charge bonus this is a bonus to your melee attack and your weapon damage so that means you get 64 extra melee attack and 64 damage and it lasts for 10 seconds and i believe it decays over that 10 seconds i don't remember the exact formula i'm sure there are better youtube videos out there but basically you do a ton of extra damage whenever you very first attack somebody um and cavalry naturally are gonna have really high amounts of this right so like 64 charge bonus there versus um four <laughs> on your lothar and sea guard okay so charge bonus is very good um chariots often have really huge charge bonuses as well so just check that out um so yeah it's on the charge but then it lasts for a little bit longer and decays now you also have a stat that's not listed here which is basically entity weight entity size um so things that weigh a lot do a certain amount of impact damage whenever they hit somebody on a charge so if you have like a huge chariot that's hitting very lightly armored um you know lothar and sea guard you're going to see those units go flying you know because of the physics there and they're going to do a lot of impact damage that's different from the charge bonus so the impact damage um determine is determined by the weight of the person hitting them and then stuff like hills matter too if you're going downhill with a big unit it's going to do more impact damage if you're going uphill it's less you know if a chariot charges a dragon or something like that the dragon's probably going to weigh more so he's not going to take as much damage off of that charge so just keep that in mind that's kind of like a hidden stat that they don't talk about here is the weight of the uh, entity and the actual damage that it's going to do when it first hits somebody off of that charge okay so yeah, those are all the base stats. And then um, other stats in the game that people that are newer to the game might be asking about is <clears throat> you have income over here. This is the total amount that you're earning from your entire province. Public order, um, on lower difficulty levels, you're not gonna get a penalty for it. On legendary, you get negative eight, and then the taxes are gonna cause you four. Pretty much, this has minimal effect in the baseline game for most factions, unless you get to negative 100. If you get to negative 100, then a rebellion spawns near your town, and it starts off with eight units, then the next turn it goes to 14, then the next turn it goes to 20, and it'll eventually attack your town and try to take it. Now, when the rebellion is out, um, you get uh, plus 20 public order per turn while it's out. So in general, if you're not trying to cheese the game, in my opinion, you should try to avoid rebellion spawning and only kill them when you have to. If you do want to cheese the game, you can just let rebellions happen and just sit there and kill them over and over again with Champion your lord and that will level up your lord really quickly so if you're in kind of a very difficult campaign and you're um you know not confident in your ability to go out and just fight standard battles against the enemy you can just kind of turtle up and hide in your town and just allow the rebellions to happen and just farm the rebellions over and over again i've seen some high level um some really popular youtubers do that on some hard campaigns like scars nick and other stuff i saw one one youtuber actually sit there and farm rebellions for like five or six hours straight in the scars nick campaign until his lord was like level 30 um until Skarsnik was level 30. So you can take it that extreme if you want. My personal opinion is I think that it cheeses the game, it exploits um, the rebellion mechanic, and it just trivializes a lot of the campaign. So I highly recommend not doing that if you want to really enjoy the game, in my opinion. But if you are newer and, you know, you just kind of want to, you need a little bit of help early on, or if you just don't want to go out and fight normal battles, then you can do that. So it's okay to farm some rebellions every now and then in a tough campaign and stuff like that. Um, but in general, I think they're intended to where you do not want to have the rebellions. <clears throat> so you have to get certain buildings to help you out with your public order and then certain events can do that and various other things. Now with the high elves, you do get an extra tax rate, growth rate, and recruitment capacity if you have really high um, public order. If you get to low public order, it's gonna cost you more to recruit you're gonna have less recruitment capacity, less growth, less taxes. So they've tried to add on a lot more penalties to make it less appealing to sit there and farm rebellions. But that's public order. Um, corruption affects public order in, in different ways depending on the faction. Um, so the more corrupt a province is, 
the more the public order penalty is going to be. So, I guess right here, see, they don't have any corruption. Um, so, corrupt places that would cause corruption would be like Norskin factions or chaotic factions, beastmen being in an area. Then there's also Skaven corruption, um, which is if there's Skaven present, and then vampiric corruption if there's vampire coast or vampire counts are in the area. So, it doesn't matter what kind of corruption is. Like, as far as public order, if you're one of the good guy factions that doesn't use one of those corrupt um, systems, Skaven and Vampires are a little different. If you want me to do a Skaven or a Vampire Coast campaign or whatever, or um, guide, just let me know. I'm happy to do one. It's just $30 for non-members, $25 for members. Um, or you can just go watch one of the campaigns for free. Um, it's a certain percentage of all corruption in the province is what happens. So... If we had one Chaos Corruption on this province, one Vampiric Corruption, and one Skaven Corruption, and then there's three Untainted, which think of that as like good guy corruption, like no corruption, um, then we have six total pieces of corruption. Three of them are my, my faction's corruption. So that means we're going to be at 50% corruption if that happens. So it's just a percentage. If there were two of each of these, of the other types, and I had three... That would be nine total. I would have three of that nine. So we would go to 66% corrupt because my type of corruption, the three, is would only be one third of the total amount present in the province. And that can have various degrees of influence on your public order. They've changed the numbers. I don't remember the exact numbers. I think they've made it more harsh. But once you start getting like every, you know, six or seven percentage points not in your favor, you might lose a corruption point. So, for example, if you were 60% um, corrupt in a province, then um, you might take like a negative 10 public order penalty or something like that. And it starts to do other things too, like when chaos is around, it'll give them like extra leadership and extra replenishment and stuff like that. So you, do, you don't want corruption in your province. So how do you fight corruption? Well, you can kill the sources of the corruption. If there are heroes sitting around your province or... Like, the Skaven can install these underground buildings under some of your main towns. Um, sometimes there's an adjacent province that has a certain building or a certain uh, technology that's spreading corruption. Like, vampires can spread corruption into adjacent provinces. Um, you need to try to deal with that. That's one way to do it. That's usually the easiest way to do it. Or you can buy more... Um, untainted buildings so some of those are usually like the holy type of buildings um in a faction so this right here the shrine of assyrian worship building is going to add untainted then untainted in adjacent provinces and stuff like that so just think of like the untainted as basically extra public order if you're going into a corrupted province so if we come over here and like let's say we start taking out some of marathi's territories marathi spreads corruption so we might take a province that's just naturally, like maybe she's been working it the entire campaign and it's like 90% corrupt. We're gonna have to get a bunch of untainted buildings to clean that up. So it changes over time. It does not go immediately. So if we go into a province that's 100% corrupt, even if we install a bunch of anti-corruption things, it's still gonna take, you know, maybe 20 turns to clean that up before it goes all the way back down to zero. So that's what corruption is basically, it's just, another thing that influences public order income growth so with most factions that are not horde factions there's a certain threshold of growth that you have to have to store up one population so one population and it tells you over here will allow you to upgrade your towns to a certain degree so like right here we need one population and then we need a certain amount of money and we can upgrade this town so we can click on that cost us the money it's gonna be built in three turns and this drop down to zero so it starts off at, it, it almost doubles every time. It's not exactly doubles, but it goes up a little bit more every time to where we need 125 to get one population. If we decide to hold that one population and go for two population, then it goes to 375. And then if we want to hold on to those two and go for three population, then it's going to go up to like uh, 750. And if we want to hold on to that and go up to four population, then I think it's like 1200 or 1500. And if we want to go up to five pop, I'm pretty sure it's um, 1,800. So why would you want to hold on to that much? So in other words, each subsequent population, if you're holding one, takes longer and longer and longer to get up there. So to get to the tier five, 
takes way, way, way longer than getting to tier one or tier two. Okay, so that creates an interesting choice, right? Do you want to go wide or tall? Tall means that you're saving up most of your population just to level up your tech really high. But then wide means that you're leveling up all of your little secondary towns. So if we got Tower of Lycian, if we had one population, for example, as soon as we get one more, we could decide, okay, do I want to save up for two to level up Lothurn to level three? Or do I want to spend that one to level up my smaller town um, for whatever reason and then start back over at zero? So it just kind of depends on the faction. It depends on what you're doing. Um, usually getting to level three pretty fast is a safe bet with most factions because that's often where you get your magic users, you get your magic here. And then typically you'll get some kind of powerful unit at level three. We can start getting Sea Guard at level three. If we wanted to, we could get like some um, ballistas. You get some pretty good stuff. Now the high elves have really, really good tier four. Tier four is the huge ticket for high elves. So getting the tier four is very important. Now the big ticket is the dragons and the sisters of Avalor. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the sisters do a ton of damage and they're really cheap. You really want a lot of these later on. This should replace all of your archers when you get them, if you can afford it. And then the, the dragons are just massive. You know, dragons in any fantasy game are really strong. But they have a lot of health, you know, big charge bonus. They do a ton of damage. They have this dragon's breath, which is like a basically like a free spell that does a ton of damage. Pretty respectable armor. They're just super strong. So you, And then you even have your sword masters if you do want elite infantry. I think that's kind of a cherry on top if you want those, but the big tickets are going to be the dragons and the sisters, so getting the tier 4 can be pretty important. Um, so yeah, just basic strategy, I guess, with elves, just to kind of interject that really quickly, is early on, I would just get a bunch of archers, just standard archers and spears, and then um, just try to rely on magic. If you want to get some silver homes, you can. This building's not, like, super impressive, um, but... You can get some of that if you want, but I would mostly just stick to just archers, spears, Tyrion, and then just try to get a wizard as fast as you can. We'll talk about magic here in a second. Um, but I would just go for that and then just try to level up and get to the, the dragons and the sisters of Avalorn as fast as you can. But your archers are going to do most of your damage. Also, getting over here to like a noble is pretty good, pretty cheap. He can go up there and face tank with Tyrion, and you just have your archers just fire into him. So you basically just want to hold him still with your spears protect your flanks and then just um, take them down with your archers if you can kind of in the mid game um some of these other buildings while we're here sometimes you'll have these specialty buildings that are usually very expensive which have really cool effects like this gives extra order recruit rank public order all that stuff this is very good for sea guard it gives money growth sea guard these are all military buildings to build the corresponding units that you want there is a skaven building here um so if you think that Skaven might have an underground building established, now there aren't any Skaven on Ulthuan, I don't think, to start with. There might be one that they added there just to my left. Um, but typically, you'll if you don't see any Skaven corruption, then there's probably no Skaven there. If, there. if you do see some Skaven corruption, then it's likely there might be some Skaven in the area and you have to build this. So it's kind of annoying. It takes eight turns to build, but it can help you find and destroy Undercities if there are any around. And it reduces your public order penalty by 50%. Um, so this actually can be very good in a super corrupted place. Like if you take over some of Marathi's places or something like that, this can actually be really massive. It can effectively give you, you know, five or six public order for pretty cheap for only 2,000. So it can be very handy in that respect. Uh, growth is usually very good to get most of the time because that allows you to power up your towns. So getting these, and they're very cheap. I usually would get like if you're trying to grow up to level three really quickly and just kind of upgrade your other towns just getting one of these it also does just getting the level one it also gives you casual replenishment and you can sell your buildings back later if you sell your buildings back you get a 60 percent refund so you can basically buy this for 500 keep it around for 10 turns while you grow up and do what you need to do and then after maybe you level the town up to level three you're thinking hey i want to get some other type of building you can sell it back you'll get 300 back off of it so I think that's something that a lot of people don't do enough that can be really strong is just get some temporary stuff and then if you're not sure what to do, just put either growth or money down and then just sell it later. Money, uh, you get money, you can trade the elven trinkets later if you want to. Plaza, public order, 
you might need to level this up a little bit depending on your difficulty level, but that can help you out with that. This helps you unlock nobles. And then this is pretty good stacking late game bonuses when you get a lot of trade agreements and you have a lot of ports um, in an area, then that can be very strong. But we're gonna pick this up just a little bit because we are gonna run out of time here. Um, so let's talk about some of the other mechanics. Um, okay, so in the diplomacy screen, um, you'll see your overall strength. This is based on your army strength. This is not based on your town strength um, at the time. And then this strength here is also army strength, not town strength. Okay, now once you get to a, um, sometimes you'll see great power penalty. So if you get to be very strong, like once you start getting a lot of towns, then you'll get negative public order or you'll get negative diplomacy with other people because they're scared of you because you're really strong. Now that is based on how many towns you own or like a certain amount of your geography and things like that. So that's different. The great power penalty is based on towns, but your strength rating is based on army. Now reliability is how everyone else views you. If you're a reliable ally or not, if you do backstab type of things, if you end tr if you end agreements and fight people, um, break agreements, you know, just that type of thing, just do treacherous stuff where you're breaking agreements, you'll have low reliability, and that means that people won't do diplomacy with you, and they're a lot more likely to declare war on you if you have low reliability. Most of the time, you do not want low reliability. Even if you're an evil, like bad guy faction where people don't like you, you still don't want ro low reliability because they're more likely to go to war with you. So even if you're beastmen or chaos or whatever, having high reliability can help you out a little bit sometimes just because it can limit the amount of enemies that you're gonna have. Okay, um, you can sign different levels of treaties. So if you look over here at Tyrannic. What would you have of the Phoenix King, stranger? Usually these go up in order. So once you have a non-aggression pact with them, which you can see here with the handshake, <clears throat> then you want to upgrade a military access, which means that you can walk on their property without taking a diplomacy penalty. Defensive alliance means that if anyone declares war on you or if anyone declares war on them, the other person is going to be obliged to join. Now they can choose not to join you if they want to, but they're going to take a huge diplomacy hit if they do that. And likewise for you, you can choose not to join them but you're gonna take a huge hit. Then military alliance is if it, if either one of you attacks somebody, then the other person has to help. So if I attack a dark elf and they're my ally, they have to help me attack as well, or they're gonna break the treaty. So defensive is just defensive. Military is defensive and offensive. And then join confederation, this is the big one. If you can get someone to join your confederation, you gain all of their property, all of their lords, you get everything they have. They basically just become part of your faction and you take a um, faction-wide penalty of like negative eight public order for five turns. And all other high elves are gonna give you negative 40 diplomacy for five turns. So you gotta be a little careful with that, but in general, you wanna take confederations with really strong factions, if at all possible. Now you can cancel non-aggression and break non-aggression um, packs with different people. So if you cancel a non-aggression pact with someone, that's fine, you won't take a penalty if you wait 10 turns before you attack them. So if you think you're gonna attack somebody potentially in 10 turns and you don't wanna hurt your diplomacy, then you need to go ahead and cancel that non-aggression. Now, if you cancel it and they attack you, that's fair game. So if you cancel it and it pisses them off and they attack you in two turns, you are you can retaliate and you won't have a diplomacy penalty. So just keep that in mind. And that's the same, I think it's 10 turns with all of these. So if you have a military alliance and you cancel it, you still only have to wait 10 turns before you can attack them if you want to. Okay, and then you can um, declare war, join war against people. <clears throat> now payments are an interesting one. You can demand payments from someone that you're on really good terms with. They don't always I do it. Unwise. But if you have a really high diplomacy with them, so this tells you the total attitude and there are various things you can do that buff that up. So ruler's tolerance towards Etain, um, that's basically my passive is what that means, the plus 20 diplomacy. Um, then you have different treaties, so the non-aggression is giving us plus 15. And then if you do things against their enemies or just various other little things they like, it'll add up. So they don't like Kalidor, so they like the fact that I trespassed. If I went to war with Kalidor and started fighting them, they would like that. So if you kill their enemies, or befriend their allies, then you're gonna gain political favor with them over time. Now, another interesting thing you can do with payments is go to offer payment, 
and you can give them gifts. So if we give them a small gift here of 458, they'll accept it. How wise. And then you get a little um, boost. So gifts given to Tyronic 10. And that's going to decay over time. So it's 10 to start with, but if nothing happens for 10 turns, it'll go back to where it was to zero. So really getting that can add up over time if you're really looking to try to get a certain treaty with them, a certain faction, a trade agreement, or really pushing for a confederation or a military alliance, then sometimes giving them some money over time can be good. So if you just do three turns of small gifts, it'll end up being 27-ish um, <clears throat> extra diplomacy, which could be enough to tip the scales to get that treaty. So the best way, if you're trying to confederate with someone, and the name of the game with High Elves is typically you want to get as many confederations as you can, particularly with the big dogs on the island. So um, Avalorn is really strong. She's another legendary lord. There's like a gold mine over here. Any of the legendary lords you want to try to get alliances with if you can. Uh, Aletha Nar is a pretty big one. He's over here. But the best way to get it is um, give them gifts if you want to do that. And then obviously get your treaties up, so try to get to military alliance, and then get in wars with the same people and kill those people. So for instance, if you see, for example, that um, Avalorn up here really hates these elves and is at war with these elves, you can declare war on those elves and they will like that. They will give you political favor for that. Now you need to be careful because those elves might, the dark elves might just bypass and run straight at you um, if you do that. But if you declare war on them, it'll give you favor. If you actually go and start killing a lot of them, it'll give you even more favor. So nothing brings people together like killing common enemies um, in total war. So that's kind of the biggest thing is if you're really, really looking to get to be a confederation, declare war on all their enemies and start killing them. And, that's, and just give them a bunch of gifts, and they'll really love that. So those are different things you can do. It gives you kind of a quick look here as well. Um, it tells you why they don't like you as well. So trespasses against Kalidor. They don't like that we're giving gifts to Tyronic or our treaties with Tyronic. And then sometimes you get an aversion, which usually is just a random roll at the start of the game with some factions where you either get plus 30 or minus 30. So it's just a little RNG there just to mix it up. Um, trade agreements. If you do get trade with somebody, there's a predetermined sort of amount of money you can get for that depending. We can't look here. Uh, it says we have no trade partners. But if you do get certain resources, you can click on that and see how much the different resources are worth. Um, and then you're going to get a certain amount of money. Now, you can only trade a percentage of your resources based on, and I don't know the exact formula, but based on how much property your ally has. So if you get a trade agreement with someone that has 30 towns, you're going to be able to sell them a lot more stuff than if you get a trade agreement with someone that has like two towns, which makes sense because there's a lot more town, there's a lot more people you can trade with. So you want to try to get trade agreements with really big factions if you can because they're going to buy all your stuff and get all your money. So even if they have your resource, a lot of times they might still buy some of it from you. It's a really weird kind of system. But basically, get especially with the elves, get as many trade partners as you can um, and just get as many resources as you can and trade with them. There are lots of different buildings that modify your trade. So for example, you have these things over here that can modify your trade. There are certain provincial edicts, which if you own all of these three properties, then you get to declare an edict, which can do different things that are beneficial. Um, so one of them here is plus 4% from trade faction wide. And if you get a trade agreement, one of the high elf special All traits is you get ready. vision of their property with just a trade agreement. So you can see everything that's going on and kind of spy on them a little bit when you're doing that. Speaking of spying, we'll get to the last couple of things here, and I think that's probably going to have to be it. And hopefully this is enough to start you off. When you get influence up here, you get influence by um, doing certain quests, um, winning some battles. Uh, there are certain heroes like the noble that can take certain actions that can give you extra um, influence. But as you get more influence, you can spend that on um, influencing different people. So if we give him five influence, we will gain political favor with him. So if we, um, you know, spent five, it might give us 15 or 20 extra political favor. So that's really, really good to help you target out a specific person that you want to try to confederate with. It's just, you know, shower them with influence, shower them with money, with gifts, go to war with their same enemies, all that kind of stuff, and you can get to those confederations pretty quickly. Um, so that's very useful. Another thing you can do with influence is it can determine some of the traits on your lords. So, for example, if we buy a lord down here... Um, 
you'll see some like this right here negator you get a couple of extra spells that are really good but it costs 60 influence if you want to get this ward so you kind of have to decide do you want really cool heroes and lords and you have to pay extra for them or do you want to save that influence to try to get the confederations most of the time i try to get the confederations and then i just try to confederate with other legendary lords and then i just use those lords or if you just confederate with other normal people you get their lords even if it's not a legendary lord so i prefer not to hire lords not to spend money on the lords just because i'm gonna acquire them through confederations anyways um and then if you don't do that if you just get an, a normal one then sometimes they have bad traits like this right here minus 15 percent speed it's like does that matter that much though on a wizard probably not you're just gonna hang out in the back and cast spells most of the time i mean some of these wizards can get on dragons eventually but i would just rather spend the influence on trying to get confederations because that's your main win condition a lot of times as high elves so that's that's my approach other people could differ about that there are some pretty good traits you can get and this goes for heroes too so like your nobles your um war masters of hoeth all that stuff can get better traits if you spend influence on it so there might be a couple of traits that are worth it but I think that um, Games Workshop, or um, Creative Assembly rather, um, changed it around to like where they weakened the traits you could get so that people would do more diplomacy with other people, or with other factions, recently. So anyways, um, there's that. A couple of really quick tricks of the trade. Um, on diplomacy, You, if you get invited to, I'm trying to remember exactly how to phrase this, but... Um, you can get around certain treaties if you get invited to war by someone else you can bypass non-aggression treaties on some people so for example if you go to um, let's see, no who, glory. okay so this guy's at war Only with sucks. broken axe tribe Speak quick. so we can say something like join war against broken axe tribe and then they have high, which means you can ask for more stuff typically. So if we do that, now you'll see these are green. So we can say, yeah, we'll declare war on those orcs for you if you give us a trade agreement and military access and non-aggression. And you can even, you know, and if they say no, you can just go back and ask for more. It doesn't matter. Like it's not going to make them mad or anything if they don't agree to it. So you could go for that and you can even ask for cash on top of that. So just say, hey, I'll do all that and give me 500 gold. And now it says moderate. So I would try it to where it goes to moderate and then ask. Tor Everest. Boom. Expects. So we just got all of that off of um, doing that agreement. So you can kind of, like, if you're ever going to declare war on somebody, try to ask for money for someone that's already at war with them so that you're not doing it for free. You might as well get a little money out of it, right? So that's free money just by, um, you know, going to war with people you were going to go to war with anyways. Um and then like let's say that for some reason i had a non-aggression pact i think this still works you know be careful test this on your own but i believe people can get around that by if i had a non-aggression pact with these guys for example these orcs and then i make an agreement with eltharian to join his war i think it gets around that non-aggression pact so that i can go to war with them because i'm not directly declaring war i'm joining eltharian's war so it's kind of law you're like but that is a way that you can get around some of these treaties, I believe. The AI will do that to you too, so be very careful. If you try to make a non-aggression with someone who hates you or who's very treacherous, like you're trying to sign a non-aggression with a Skaven who has like negative 200 diplomacy with you, just be careful. If there's another Skaven or a Dark Elf around there, they might still go to war with you because they will just join the war of that Dark Elf on you and then they bypass that non-aggression. It's like, well, I didn't declare war on you. I just joined someone else who's also at war with you. So no treaty broken. You know, it's kind of weird. Um, but I think you used to be able to bypass it like that. And I think that you still can to a certain degree. Um, but you definitely want to try to get money anytime you go to war. See if you can get some of those bypass agreement type of things. Um and yeah, that's probably it for diplomacy. Okay, and that's pretty much it for this video. Um, hopefully I covered most of what you need. Technology is pretty self-explanatory. You just pick different techs. They give you different bonuses that you want. It levels up. Sometimes it requires certain buildings. It'll tell you there exactly what the building is that you need. So it even points to it if you click on it. Hey, you need this building to get this tech. Um, some of the really important ones is high elves. 
you want to try to get to um, archery prowess that's 15% for your early archers and then spear wall and then over here the big stuff at level 2 that's important are um, missile strength light armor because that's armor for basically everything and missile strength for um, basically everything including your sisters of Avalorn. So this is why I really like to go for the archers earlier, like those archer upgrades, because you get so many other upgrades that work well with it. So you get these upgrades to archers, you get these upgrades to archers, um, you get extra armor, which applies to your archers. So there's just a lot of really good stuff that goes into that. And then eventually, once you get some trade stuff, uh, once you get a tier three trade building for different resources, you get these specialty buffs. So for instance, if you get a level three wine place, Vintner, then you get plus two public order faction wide. And even if you lose that later on, like let's say that someone, um, you know, burns my town that has the Vintner on it, you still get to keep the technology. Okay, and that's the same thing with any of these. So even if you lose the building or you decide to demolish the building that gives you access to this tech, that's fine. As long as you've completed the tech, it's cool. So if you just want to build an archive, for example, hire a sorceress, and then you're really strapped for space in a town and you're like, hey, I don't have enough room. I also want to be able to hire, um, you know, uh, some Eagle Claw bolt throwers, but you know, I've only got so much room in my town. No problem. Just build this for 5,000 gold, complete that technology, hire your sorceress, sell it back. You'll get 3,000 gold back. And then you spent 2,000 gold to get the tech and to get a sorceress. And now you have an open slot so that you can, um, you know, build out whatever you, whatever else you want to build out. So you are losing 2,000 gold in that transaction, but that is a way that you can kind of be efficient when you don't have enough building slots out there. So, and that's really, really important with certain factions that have, like, that have really crappy capitals where you only have, like, two extra slots um, on a Tier 3 town. Okay, and then the final thing, and then this is really going to be over with, um, I'll just look at magic, I think, really quickly. Um, we looked at intrigue. Rights are pretty self-explanatory. You just spend gold. You get these bonuses for a certain amount of time. It just tells you exactly what those do. Um, the public order one's really important at higher elos, and this one's really good when you're about to siege. This hammer basically allows you to break one of the walls, not the entire wall, but just like create a crack in one part of the wall where your um, units can go in through. So that's pretty handy and you get a cool item, and it's not very much gold. <clears throat> but I'll just go through magic just super fast here, and then we'll be done. I do want to touch on it. I said I would a little bit. High Elves have a bunch of different schools of magic you can get. In my opinion, and if this is happening in the future, you know, double check this. You know, come on stream if you want ask me, um, if you want to know. But uh, I think that with the baseline game, Fire Magic and War of Life are gonna be the strongest. In SFO, if you're playing with a Steel Faith overall mod, the SFO mod, I believe that War of Beasts are one of the strongest. But in the base game, it's still War of Life. And basically, when you start when you start a, um, a battle, then you're going to get a certain amount of Winds of Magic, which is like your mana, and then it refills over time over the course of the battle. So there's a certain maximum that you have. Maybe you have 100 max, but you start with 15. And then it just slowly fills up as the battle goes on. So that's what this is. It costs you six mana to cast this. So the lower, the better. Um, and what you're looking for, a lot of times, the best spells are going to be things that are multi-target. So it can hit multiple enemies and either do a ton of damage to the enemies or do a ton of healing or really high impact buffs to your allies. So just like in every other game, healing is overpowered. It always is because healing works with your physical resist, your melee attack, um, all of this other stuff, right? Um, to a certain extent. So whenever you heal somebody for, and it even tells you what it heals for now, which is really nice. It didn't used to tell you this. Um, but if you heal somebody for 672, you know, and let's say that they only have a one third, a 33% chance to hit you, um, and if you have like 100 armor that's going to reduce the damage by 50 percent then you're going to have to multiply this by three so they're going to have to do about 2,000 damage in order to cancel this out because they're only going to hit you one third of the time um to cancel out the 672 and then they're going to have to do twice as much damage because it's going to get reduced by 50 percent so they're really even in that very simple scenario right 
Um, they have a 33% chance to hit you because you have 12 more melee defense than they have melee attack, and you have 100 armor. They're going to have to do 4,000 damage to cancel this out. In a really simple scenario, just because of how the defense stacks multiplicatively. And that's why healing is so crazy, is just because like there are so many modifiers that make it difficult to do damage in this game. You've got the melee attack, or you've got the melee defense rather, you have the shields, missile resist, physical resist, ward saves, um, armor, there's just so many different modifiers. So that's what makes this spell in particular super, super powerful because it heals and um, it's AOE. So it heals everyone within 30 units. Now there's up to a maximum of four units that are healed, but that's still insane. Like, that is a lot of healing. So effectively, if you're hitting four units with this, you're healing for, or they're gonna have to do, based on that simple math I just did right there, they're gonna have to do like 16,000 damage to cancel out one cast of this that costs 11 mana. Like that's so much damage, it's nuts. <laughs> so that's why healing is so good. Particularly later on in the game when you get to stuff that has the higher armor the stuff that has a lot of health and other defensive measures like dragons not only do they have like armor physical resist terror causing which can make people flee all this kind of stuff but they can just fly up in the air and reposition right so it's the same with cavalry as well so it, healing is just super super strong um, in pretty much every game and total war is no exception then you have flesh to stone which gives a ton of extra armor so this is great for face tanking you just want to throw Tyrion in and just have him just tank like you know three different infantry blobs up there while you're firing on him with archers or you just want a dragon just to fly in there and just tank a bunch of enemies this is awesome just give him 60 armor he's going to be invulnerable for 44 seconds against a lot of units shield of thorns is very good as well now this is going to give you um 30% extra damage and 22% physical resistance, which is really, really good. It lasts for 22 seconds. It's AOE, so this is area of effect. This healing's area of effect. Then you have regrowth, which is just a crazy amount of healing on a single target, 1300. So that's basically double what um, uh, the other one is, regrowth or whatever it's called, uh, earth blood. Um, so this is really good against a single target. It's basically a triple earth blood. Actually, a Quadra Earthblood on a single target. And it gives you back 100% of your Vigor, which we didn't go into Vigor. I forgot to mention that, but just watch the combat video if you want to know more about Vigor. This is already a super long video. Um, basically, the more tired you are, you lose all sorts of stats. You're less melee defense, less armor, less melee attack, less movement speed. You're just really bad when you're tired. But this is going to give you back all of your Vigor. So if you cast this after, like, you know, 10 minutes into a fight on a really important unit, it's massive. Um, and then you have an AoE damage ability that's direct damage. It has a pretty good um, area of effect, as you can see there. And it just does a ton of damage. It'll just completely melt people in sieges. So <clears throat> Life Magic basically has it all. Like, it has a really good Vortex spell, which is stationary too, which means that you can cast this in traffic and know that it's only going to hit the enemies, not your own allies. There's no chance this hits your own allies if you control them properly. So that's very, very good, especially on sieges where everyone's going to be blobbed up against those like major choke points where you're going in. Very strong. Um, lasts for 15 seconds, too, which is a really long time. So a very good vortex spell, um, really good AoE healing, really good single target healing, really good single target sort of buff. If you cast Flesh to Stone and Regrowth on someone, like your Lord or something, they're just never going to die. And you have Shield of Thorns, which is a pretty good sort of AoE, like, infantry buff, if you need that. So, they just have so many different things. And they're passive. It doesn't say what that is, but every time you cast a life spell, it gives everyone on the entire map a little bit of healing. It's not a lot. It's probably, like, 100 health or something like that, but it adds up. And everything's really cheap. You know, this is 6 to start with. You know, 13, still very reasonable. 8, 6... Um, 17 is good for a vortex spell so super strong the other one that um, I mentioned was fire now this one's a lot more offensive and this one's super good early in the game against um, really lightly armored targets so I think that life is very it, it's like it's good early but it's super good late once you get more armor and higher tier units and stuff like that 
Whereas fire is ultra good offensive early on if you're just going to be facing swarms and swarms of low level units. It's very good. So great against things like Skaven and Dark Elves. Tyrion's not going to face too much of that early on, but like Emric, this was huge against Skaven. Um, but it has a really good defensive spell here for four, so that's that's solid. It has a nice buff for both infantry or um, ranged units. Now this does magical damage and fire damage, so if you're facing something that has a lot of physical resist or stuff that's really vulnerable to fire, that can be very handy. Um, then Burning Head. This is really what makes the fire tree in the early game. It looks really cool, but it's a wind spell that you can aim just like that right there. It just goes straight down their infantry line when they're all grouped up and it completely wipes them out. It does massive damage. It only costs 10. It even does extra leadership penalties to them, so it's more likely they run. So a great trick here is you just line up your spears. You soften them up with your archers as they come in. You line up your spears on them there. Um, you throw a burning head down them like that, just wipe them out, and then you just have some cavalry or something charge in from the back to hit them with that extra leadership penalty. It'll just completely annihilate almost any early game army. Um, so yeah, super strong there. And then, so the, the main ticket is just going to be burning head early on. You're just going to spam that most of the time, and then maybe cascading fire cloak to help your lord out. Flaming sword of ruins okay later on. And then Flamestorm is pretty good in Sieges. It does a lot of damage. It's a much smaller area than the Life Magic. Um, so that's kind of iffy, but and it, it does move around, as you can see. So it can hit your own units if it takes a bad turn. So you really only want to do that in Sieges most of the time. Or another alternative thing you can do is send in like single entity units, like throw Tyrion in, have him face tank three battalions of infantry throw a dragon in, have a dragon face tank three battalions of infantry, and then drop the flame storm on him. Because it doesn't do a lot of damage to single units, like a lord, but it does a ton versus infantry. Um, <clears throat> so, just watch the Emric campaign if you want to see fire magic at work. I do that a lot. Um, and there are tons of fights where we're just fighting just hordes and hordes of greenskins and skaven, and we're just lighting them up with magic, with the fire magic. So... Um, the bonus for this school of magic is whenever you cast spells, it makes the enemy team vulnerable to fire damage. So, um, this is going to be very good. It means all your spells are doing like 20% extra damage. And, um, remember this imbues fire damage. So not only are you getting like, you know, 25% extra missile damage, but they're taking 22% extra damage from fire. So it's really like you're getting... 25% and then an additional 22% of that modified 25%. So it's like even better than 40% extra damage. So it's very, very good. And if you have any units that do fire damage, like fire dragons or anything else, Emric has some different um, ward skills that give everyone in your army fire damage for certain periods of time. Um, then that's going to be very good. So great in a lot of situations. Fire is definitely one of the strongest schools out there. Okay, I won't go over the other ones just because we don't have enough time. I don't want this to be a two-hour video, but those are the two I would stick with, life and fire. There are some other good ones, like, you know, you can make, like, high magic and some other stuff work, but that's what I, what I recommend, especially for newer players. Just go with life magic. You're just healing your own units. You don't have to worry about accidentally burning your own units with Burning Head or Flamestorm. Um, but, yeah, I would just pick one of those two schools of magic. Anyways, um, that's going to be it. So special thanks again to Lucas. Hopefully I covered pretty much everything you need to know to get started. Um, be sure to check out the Emric campaign, and I'll also link um, an older Tyrion campaign that I've done if you want to see like how I start off some of the earlier turns. Some of it has changed from the um, earlier Emric or the earlier Tyrion campaign because these uh, greenskins didn't used to be on the island. They've changed up some of the geography. Um, so just be aware that the game balance does change over time. <clears throat> but um, the Emric one is a very fresh new campaign you can check out. And if you want me to do a new Tyrion campaign, if anyone out there wants to see it, you know, just donate. I'm happy to do it for you. But anyways, that's going to be it. Um, have a good day. We'll see you everybody next time.